snooze right now so we should be all right um it's really great to be here virtually with this incredible lineup of people i'm really honored and what i'm going to do about this talk about this evening is um it's at the way the heart of my new book vesper flights it's, it's a collection of essays but it's also something of an autobiography and what the book tries to do in these different pieces is trace the history of how i came to understand that stories about nature are nearly always at heart stories we tell about ourselves and that's what i'm going to talk about um, in this talk so when i was five years old my parents moved to a house in surrey that was um, just happened to be on an estate owned by the theosophical society they weren't theosophists they were hard-bitten journalists but there we were and it was this bonkers place straight out of a storybook I mean, there were Italian at gardens, there were huge trees to climb, there was parkland and ponds, and I just ran wild in this place, and it was very safe. And I spent you know, hours and hours on my own looking for life. And I filled jars and aquaria with tadpoles and newts, and I turned over rocks, and I pressed my face into the grass of the meadow and looked at the tiny things moving around in the grass stems, and it was really miraculous. And all the animals I found made the world seem bigger and more interesting. And I craved their company and, and I learned their names from field guides the same way that I wanted to know the names of my friends from school. They made the outside feel like home. They made the natural world a place of complicated and beautiful safety. And I think so many of the stories we tell about nature are about testing ourselves against it, defining ourselves against it, setting ourselves and our humanity against it. But this was nothing like that at all. And back then, of course, as many of you know, I was pretty obsessed with hawks. All my friends had pictures of rock stars on their bedroom walls, and I had pictures of falcons and eagles. I was an incredibly sad child. And it was an obsession that developed into a, a many years as a falconer. And I kept hawks for years. And then I um, went off to university, and suddenly there wasn't any time for hawks anymore. Um, but it was during this English degree that I learned, I think, how to properly read and what i mean by that is that i discovered for the first time that books and poems were bigger and deeper than they'd seemed before and they held these hidden meanings that reflected the concerns of the societies that created them and i learned how to find those meanings and i also wore a lot of black and smoked filterless camels and i sort of angsted my way around this the place as well i did all that but i and i forgot about hawks um but then they came back because when I left university after my English degree, I worked in falcon conservation in the Gulf states, as you do after an English degree. And I worked particularly on falcon species that were used or affected by Arab falconry. And while I was there, I kept seeing conservation initiatives from Western organizations failing because no one seemed to pay much attention to the vast significance, the, the emotional and cultural importance of these birds to the people who kept and associated with them. And I knew that this was something that I needed to think about and think about like really, really carefully. I've got some notes here, because I'm very bad at remembering things. So um, I went back to university and some part of me had, I think, I finally realized what my subject was. And it wasn't literature. It was the curiosity of that small child who'd been turning over rocks and watching insects. And it was the curiosity about how we use animals to teach us how to live. And that's when things got really interesting for me. Because when I went back to university, I remembered all those ways I'd learned to analyze books and poems. And I determined that I'd use those skills to think about this new question. And I got really interested in particular in the cultures of natural history in Britain around the time of the Second World War. And it was completely amazing. You know, we tend to see science as this objective, dispassionate way of engaging with the world. But it turns out that a lot of the underpinnings of science can be as much about ourselves as the creatures and animals that we study. So one of the people I, I got really obsessed with back then was a naturalist called James Fisher. You know, back in, in those days, all naturalists seemed to be extremely posh and they tended to wear a lot of tweed rather than Gore-Tex. And during the Second World War, he was 
completely and utterly consumed with studying this bird called a fulmar. It's a bit like a kind of bird called a tube nose, about a small albatross. And back then they were expanding their range really, really fast around the British coastline. They were spreading down from the north. And um, he wrote this scientific monograph that, you know, if you read it with this in mind, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's completely soaked in wartime invasion anxiety. You know, he details the the rapid expansion of their range along the, around Britain. He talks about the encirclement and penetration of British coasts. He requested military coastal command stations to look out for full miles as well as enemy aircraft. And he even arranged for RAF reconnaissance training flights to photograph their nesting cliffs. And you read his book and it's kind of panicky. He's like, I don't know where they're gonna stop. You know, will they ever stop coming? So everyone at this time, not just Fisher, seemed to be using nature to speak about the war. So bird migration across national boundaries became an incredibly hot topic. In Norfolk, farmers started shooting skylarks um, that came to their fields in winter because science had shown that they actually came over from Germany. And there were headlines in the local press saying, you know, skylarks that sing to Nazis will have no mercy here. And all the wildlife around us in Britain at that time seemed to become loaded with national identity. So when the naturalist Peter Scott went off to war, he literally looked back from the deck of the destroyer on the waves and he realized that the reason he wanted to fight was to protect the ducks that nested in the, in the reed beds behind his home. And of course, these are species that nest all over Europe, all over Northern Europe, but somehow they were England. Um, Julian Huxley, another very famous scientist, was you know, constantly said at the sort of radio talks that you know, if you don't know your animals around you, if you don't know the British animals, you don't really know your country. It's a mark of national identity. And the most scientific ecologists constantly reflected their own social assumptions in the work they were doing. So um, Charles Elton, um, who discovered population um, cycles in predators and prey, he saw in his early work the ecological networks um, around him as very like the social structure of an English village. He said that when you see a badger, you should know its place in the community just as if you'd said, there goes the vicar. So that's what I was doing. I was discovering that when we talk about nature, even often in the questions we ask in science, what we're doing often is telling stories that use nature to make natural, true, and self-evident things that are merely accidents of history and culture. And the process, of course, is called naturalization because nature is being taken as the ultimate proof of what things are. So here's another thing. We quite often tend to think that being out in the countryside is, it gives us solace. It offers us um, refuge from persecution and judgment. But of course, it's not free of social meaning either. You know, deep down, I think I still struggle somewhere with this intuition that uh, because I'm not a man, I don't have the authority to talk about nature. It's, it doesn't belong to me. It's not mine to talk about. And, and there are so many voices about nature that the world hasn't been given the opportunity to hear. Um, some of the most extraordinary field natural historians I know, they grew up in working class communities. And there's little room for them in today's culture of nature appreciation. And there's even less so in nature writing, which tends to, I think, to entrench this sense that the correct relationship to the landscape is through distanced looking and walking and viewing, you know, um, with a kind of aesthetic uh, sense. And I think more than ever, um, we need more voices. Uh, we need more diversity, we need more variousness in writing about the natural world. And we need to hear the words of people of color, people from marginal communities, trans and women writers. Um, because nature is not a singular thing, and nor are we, and nor are the practices that take us to it. And I think the, the question at the heart of so much nature writing is, of course, the old question. It's Thoreau's question, and the question is how to live. And my answer to the big question is what all the lessons of my life have taught me, and it's what the book talks about. There is no one right way to talk about nature or think about it. Um, but we must fight with, I think, all that we have right now in this great sixth extinction. Um, we must cause good trouble in, in the cause of um, in the cause of lives that are not like our own. We need landscapes that that are buzzing and glowing with life. And I think to be truly human, we, we should learn to delight in a world that's full of things that are not us. And we should love them because they are not like us. And people often ask me, you know, do we, you know, 
do we feel grief? Do we have to mourn what's happening to biodiversity? And of course we do. We have to mourn what's disappearing through habitat loss, through pesticides, through the climate crisis, through things that make the world ever darker, quieter and smaller. We need to feel that grief, not dissociate from it. We need to mourn to change ourselves. And over everything, we have to fight for what we love, not are. So get out there, pay attention, believe it is yours because it is. And I think no matter what cultural boundaries have been set up and are endlessly and sometimes violently policed against you, those th thriving, growing kind of, you know, landscapes and full of creatures, they belong to you too. And here's a trick that I learned. When you look at a creature or a landscape, um, try and think about the human meanings you're projecting upon it, those assumptions that you give it. Because the trick is that if you keep those meanings at the forefront of your mind, sometimes you can just push them aside just a little way. And you can see the magical reality of the actual creature, this inhuman, strange creature behind all our assumptions. And the real magic is too that sometimes the animals can do that for you. And I'm going to just read this little bit here. I'm going to read this out because I can never remember it. But it's about the time when I was in New Zealand. I was walking along a grassy kind of sun crisp headland and I wanted to see something very much. And I wasn't sure whether it was going to happen because it needed to be windy to see it happen. And it was a very, very still blue day and the sky was a remote blank blue. So, my goodness, have I lost the piece of paper? How extraordinarily awful. I can't believe I've done that. Let me bring it up from somewhere else. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read the bit out. And then the wind came. The wind came suddenly and it was a venison. It rolled off off the ocean and there in front of us, a lump of white started to move. It raised awkward stick-like arms covered in fluffy down and it wobbled them. Wings that hadn't yet grown. It looked like a, like a small child in a ghost outfit. It was a young albatross and it had sat there for many days looking out to sea. I thought of Theseus's ships, of the black sails coming home, and of Coleridge's albatross and Baudelaire's albatross, and our imperial visions of global exploration, and romantic notions of solitude, and caught up with Coleridge's albatross was a biting sense of human guilt at what we're doing to the world. Because when big things happen, old stories are always conjured along with the new. And the wind continued to blow, and then the albatross came. The albatross came and it was, it was too big to understand. It was as if a dog were hanging there in the air. It came in on the wind, its long knife-like wings bowed and webbed feet spread as rudders. It was the most astonishing thing. And as it curved in, it turned its head and looked at me with those mild Madonna eyes down its long squid cutting beak and I was absolutely lost for words. Its world was wind and sea and spray and salt and the uplift from rolling swell over the Southern Oceans. And it looked right through all the stories I'd ever been told about the world and the air shivered with its newness. Thank you. <laughs>